Amen. What a, what a great time of worship. Good morning. So glad you're here to celebrate National Chicken Wing Day. I hope the team you root for, your commercial that you're rooting for, wins. Uh, I just want to say welcome. I'm Chris, one of the pastors here at our church. And if you have any sort of question, uh, this might be your first time. You've been here a, a little while, but you want to know how to, how to get connected or what's going on. Go over after we're done to this room to your right. There's a teal tent and, and some of our friendliest people are there. And they just love to answer your questions, get to know you. And we have a gift for you if this is one of your first times, your first time over there. And the way that you really uh, need to stay connected, if this uh, is a church you want to connect with, or you're here with us on a regular basis, is through our app. So please get that if you haven't. If you do have it, get it out your app and uh, make sure you do your service check-in. If you're not awake yet, this is the 10 a.m. option. You'll see it pop up uh, as you open up your dashboard and uh, what's really cool is if you do that, you see little buttons where it says, hello, Greg, and there's those little icons. You get all those lit up. You get like, no, you don't get anything. But uh, there's just some really important things there, and you can look at how to get connected, and that's going to be something I'm going to come back to. This week, we're celebrating baptisms from 2022, and that's, I'm just excited. Yeah, you should, uh, you should be excited, too. You, you see the balloons over there. 86 people were baptized uh, as a part of our church, the corner, our high school ministry, all kids, adults, it was just a phenomenal year. And, and we just want to recognize all of those uh, who made that decision. If you were baptized last year in 2022 as any kind of part of our church, you're one of those 86, would you just stand up for a second? We're not going to make you talk or do anything. Whoa, you guys are right there. Look at this. Come on. All right, you guys keep standing just for a second. Mike, come on, come on, just for a little bit longer. All right, if you at any point in our church's history, because of our church, whether it's in this building or, or like at the creek or something, but our church was a part of your journey and you've been baptized here at Christ Church, would you stand up too? Anybody throughout all the different years? Yeah, just for a quick second. Look at that. That's pretty awesome. Very cool. Well, we're doing all kinds of stuff. You guys can sit down. Thank you so much. Uh, after service, we have some cupcakes in the lobby, because why wouldn't you celebrate with cupcakes? 86 people being baptized, just what God's doing. So those cupcakes, whatever issue you have, calories, sugar, gluten, those are healthy Jesus cupcakes. I, I don't know what dairy, you know, pick a thing. You can have a cupcake at church. None of that stuff counts. I'm just kidding. Don't get sick and blame me. But... Here, here's what I want to say for just a second. Maybe you haven't been baptized. Maybe you're still like sitting going, what is that? Let me just read a little bit of, of what Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, said about this, this idea of baptism. You go underwater. Uh, you, you saw some of the pictures. And you'll see some video later. And, and you're demonstrating, kind of recreating Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection. And Peter says it's this. He says this water, this is uh, 1 Peter 3.21, if you want to look at it later. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was dead. He was buried. And and on that first Easter Sunday, he resurrected, friends. And that gives us the opportunity to live life with him, to enter into baptism, to enter into relationship, covenant with God himself because of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. I don't know what's going on in your life, but there are often times that it's just comforting to know the one that I follow has everything in submission to him. No matter what it looks like right in front of me, at the end of the day, it's Jesus who wins. Here's what, what he says a couple verses later. Those of us who followed and have been baptized and are following Jesus, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. That's what we're saying. We don't have it all figured out. Maybe you don't know all the answers to all the, the, the questions but you know 
that you want to live for God's will, that the one who has angels, authorities, and powers and submission to him is the one you want to follow. So you can text the number on the screen. After we're done, uh, myself and others will be over there where it says prayer. We can just talk. We have the stuff you want to get baptized. There's water in there. It's still pretty warm. I just checked it a little while ago. And between services, we'd love to, to let you make this decision as well. So we just celebrate all of you who were baptized last year. And just say, if, if, if you're ready, God's Holy Spirit is in your heart saying, now is your day. Then let's do that. The thing that, that, that I also want to mention is when you give to our church, when my family gives, when you, your family give, of God's resources to this work, you are doing good deeds. You are making an impact. Often I, I, I get asked, what is it? What does it mean to, to be spiritually deep, to, to grow in maturity? And, and the thing that I've come to conclude, and not just me, many others, is when you read what Jesus said in his biographical accounts, when you read what, what Peter writes, and John and Paul, all of the New Testament writers, they conclude one thing, that growing deep, being spiritually mature, it's about what you do. In our culture today, we think it's often about what we know, and what, we, what we consume and what we learn. But all over the New Testament, it's about action. And, and when you are here for worship, when you're involved in a life-changing relationship, when you live selflessly and, and, and give your tithes and offerings or serve and give your time, you are being spiritually mature. You're growing deeper by those actions. We uh, recently had a time to, to sit down with one, uh, two guys who lead one of our life groups. They lead the life group over in Williams. And, and they just start talking about their experiences and the impact that our resources as a church are having on them. So let's, let's check out what uh, Bob and Rob have to say about the impact you and I are having. Hi, I'm Bob. I'm from uh, Williams. I'm with uh, Williams Life Group. I'm Rob, and I'm with the Williams Life Group of Christ Church Flagstaff, and we've been a part of this group, leading this group actually, for about 14 years now. We were introduced uh, to the Life Group by friends of ours who were actually started, invited us to go to Christ Church Flagstaff. We started going there, and then they said they were coming here for, for Life Group and uh, invited us to come. The summary of what we try to be as a group is a, a group that does, and we've got a long standing practice of not just trying to learn more, but also help each other follow Jesus by applying that. You would find in speaking to the members of our group that Christ has transformed them. I think the changes have been gradual in all of us. My wife and I are both naturally introverts, but I think being a part of the, this group has helped us to be more open and more vulnerable, which is not something that's natural for introverts. The relationships that have been developed through our life group are totally life-changing and I've just had such a strong connection with my friends at our group uh, that I'm just so thankful for that relationship that we've developed. Wow, just, it's, it's a cool thing, you know, it's a, kind of what I look at, think about in the, in the early church and, and how you know, home churches just really affected the communities that they were in back in the first century. It's just, I feel like we're connected in that way to the, the first church. And to me, it's... I just feel like that's what we're supposed to be doing. got to be careful what we pray for because if we pray for opportunities sometimes we're a little overwhelmed but I, I think back to over these last 14 years and some of the opportunities that we've had to, to bless the community you know from having a wood for warmth program where we were cutting extra salvage firewood so that we could help people get through those tough times of the winter heated exclusively with wood and some of those stories unfolded to where we were delivering wood to people with cancer and, and we're able to pray with people and have opportunities beyond just the blessing of the wood and so whether it's individuals that we've been able to help or whether it's through a, a group effort uh, we've really really had a heart for the community and for the people and been able to 
to really make a difference in people's lives in, in so many different ways. You know, I think about all this and, uh, you know, it makes us look like we're saints and stuff, but we're, just, we're not. We're just people who see opportunities and just take advantage of those. And everybody has those opportunities. They're in front of everybody every day. And that's it's true. It is such an important part of what we do is we don't do it individually. It's just there's strength in numbers. And I think that's one of the dynamics of, of small groups is that we're connected well to the community, to the needs of the community. Being a part of a life group is, is definitely a commitment. Uh, and it's something that we, my wife and I have committed to for a long time. Uh, it's Yeah, it's been challenging. It's you know, been challenging with being, you know, with having little kids or with job conflicts or, or with just life getting in the way. But there's dynamics that you don't get with being a part of a church unless you're part of a small group or a home group. It's important. It's important to me. It's important to my wife. It's, and it's important to the other people. And I kind of feel like the small group is where the rubber meets the road. To those who might be hesitant or haven't checked out the life groups uh, that are available, it's uh, it's based on in individuals connecting, and so we've developed relationships to where we've earned the right to be heard. And I feel like I think what we what we have to offer in relationship is what people are ultimately looking for. You know, we've been connected to Christ Church for 16 years now, and we got connected at a very difficult time in our lives. And quite frankly, we lay low for about two years. We didn't even want anybody to know who we were. We are just at a very broken place. And after that two years, there was just so much healing that came into our lives. We just realized, hey, we've got to take some of this back to our neighborhood, to our community. And that's when the life group started here in Williams. And so with that, uh, we just, thank Christ Church of Flagstaff for all the support. We've had so much support over the years for our group in so many different ways, and we're thankful for that. We couldn't have done it without Christ Church of Flagstaff, but Christ Church of Flagstaff puts such a priority on, on these life groups, and we see it as the foundation of the church. And we're so thankful for that emphasis. So just to echo what Rob said at the end, thank you. You make that possible. And God does amazing things when, we, when we're together. And uh, if that's something that, you, as you watch their story and what's happening in Williams, and, and honestly, at other, many others, a couple dozen other groups throughout uh, our area and, and Flagstaff, it's happening all over the place. And maybe you want more of that in your life. You just go back to the app or you can talk to the folks at the tent. And, and the app, that icon with the little people, when you get to your dashboard, if it's not lit up, you just, you just hit it, and it'll show you the instructions and get the information and understand what's going on in life groups, or you'll see a little thing in your news feed there. But that's the place to go. Uh, I'm gonna pray, and then Andrew's gonna come and share our message as we continue our series one at a time. Pray with me. God, I, I just thank you for people like, Bob and Rob, who, who take the time to, to step out and lead. And, and I just thank you for everyone who's a part of Christ Church who, who allow these things to happen, of being generous with your resources that you've entrusted to us, with, with our time, with our energy, our attention. God, when we give it back to you, you multiply it, and you do amazing, incredible things. And to watch the spiritual depth and maturity develop in these groups has just been so encouraging. God, I pray that those of us who your spirit right now is just putting that urge to have what they just saw in their life. God, give us the courage to take those steps to explore it, to get the information and to be involved in relationships that change our lives so that we can be more like the people you've made us to be. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Christ Church. My name is Andrew, um, and if we haven't met, would love to meet you after service. Uh, but even if we have met, what you may not know about me is that after I graduated from Biola University in 2003, I quickly hopped on a plane and moved to Kunming, China, where I spent three years working as a youth pastor for missionary kids. My time there was truly incredible and life-changing in many ways. And what I loved about working there is I got to work with students from all over the world and from every Christian tradition imaginable. But what I started to realize while in China is that we spent a lot of time around the table, especially at holidays. In fact, 
Here's a picture from 2004, it's Easter. And if you look closely enough, yes, I do have some killer mutton chops during this season of my life. Um, but no, during holidays, we would feast. And around this table are some of my favorite people. Uh, two seats down from me, Mr. C. He was a teacher at the International Academy I worked at. And just a few days prior to this picture, we were actually in Lhasa, Tibet together, um, just soaking in uh, that culture and what it all means. Um, this Easter, we're at the home of uh, Tom and Sue Kimber, and I spent many holidays, many hours actually at their house because Tom and Sue were my mentors there. Uh, Tom mentored me, helped me grow in ministry and in faith and life in ways um, I just hadn't experienced before. In fact, Tom was so important to us that he actually married Claire and me in 2010. Uh, but we lingered at the table a lot. Even after the food was long gone, dessert had been served, dishes had been cleared, we stayed at the table, even though the, di even though the living room couches were just nothing more than 10 feet away. And if you've ever noticed, there are chairs that are more comfortable than dining room chairs. But we stayed at the table. We lingered. And it was during my time in China that I began to ask myself this question, why do we spend so much time at the table? What's happening with food and the table that just seems different than any other aspect of our lives? And then in 2006, while I was still in China, I was reading Living the Resurrection by Eugene Peterson. And Eugene Peterson's one of my favorite authors. And as I was reading that book, I came across a quote that, that has opened my eyes and changed my life in ways that no other quote has outside of Scripture. And you're probably thinking to yourself, come on, Andrew, really? Like... But no, like this quote helped me see new things in Scripture, helped me see a theme running continuously throughout Scripture from the very first page all the way to the last page. And, and here is what Eugene Peterson wrote in 2006. The gospel writers are fond of telling stories of Jesus at meals. The meal was one of their favorite settings for showing Jesus as he revealed himself, talked, worked, and welcomed men and women to him. Jesus loved food. Jesus loved to be in people's homes. Jesus loved telling stories about food. And it was from this quote I began just to see how much Jesus was at the table, how many times he was welcoming people, how much time he spent in other people's homes. But not only with Jesus, but I saw throughout all of the Bible how often food keeps showing up time and time again. Think about it. From the very first page, from the very first story, God puts Adam and Eve in a garden full of incredible food, full of incredible bounty for them to partake in. And he gives them the one prohibition, and, and that prohibition is do not eat from a specific tree. But they do eat from that tree. And so sin enters the world through a bite of food. But thanks be to God that he still redeems us and when he wants us to remember his redemption, when he wants us to participate in that redemption, what does he ask us to do? He asks us to eat. For the Jewish people, it was the Passover meal. And for us in this room and for millions of other Christians around the globe today, it's through the Lord's table. It's communion. And then if you continue reading the Bible, the, the very last image we are given in Revelation it is the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the very end, we are given not a sermon, we're not even given a worship service, but we're given a feast, a meal, a table. And so for over 15 years, I, I've literally been consumed with this question about the importance of food. And not just from a physical standpoint, sure, you and I gotta eat, to survive, but really from what does it mean to be human? What does it mean that we are hungry? And what does food point us to that is beyond ourselves so that we can truly flourish, not only as individuals, but as a community? Because when God created fruits and vegetables, he didn't just give us the bare minimum. I don't know if you know this, but there are over 7,500 different varieties of apples in the world. 2,500 are grown right here in the U.S. alone. And I did the math this week, and if you and I were to eat a different apple each and every day, it would take us close to seven years 
to eat 2,500 different apples. And for me, that's too much to comprehend. So often I'm reminded of God's bounty when I walk into the grocery store and I see bell peppers, right? Because every time you walk into the grocery store and you have to buy a bell pepper, you have to choose between a red, orange, yellow, or green bell pepper. And sometimes if you're lucky, there's actually a purple bell pepper. And I don't know about you, but my palate's not nuanced enough and discerning enough to tell the difference between those different types of bell peppers. And yet God in his goodness and in his bounty and his celebration of life and food decided we needed a rainbow and not just one. And so this question, why do we spend so much time around the table has changed my life. It's taken me to places I never thought imaginable. It's led to a different relationship with my grandpa that I want to tell you about later. I've gotten to read some incredible books, meet some incredible people, talk to some incredible people. It eventually led me to enroll in culinary school where I got to cook not only in Los Angeles, but in Park City. And along the way, I've gotten to eat some incredible meals. Meals centering around right truffle risotto, all the way to the simple peach donut that when my best friend Ty and I took a bite, we looked at each other giggled like little schoolgirls and cried. <laughs> the donut man in Glendora on Route 66, in case you're curious. But beyond the food, this journey has led me to begin to see the sacredness of food and the table, the beauty, the connection that is possible around the table that just isn't possible in other instances. And so that's why when you and I, we think about our one, that person, that family who needs Jesus, we can't forget, we must remember our table and the meals we share together. Because again, as Eugene Peterson pointed out, the meal was one of Jesus's favorite places to reveal himself, talk, work, and most importantly, welcome men and women to himself. And so if you haven't been with us these past few weeks, we've been going through this series called One at a Time. Because we recognize in the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, that Jesus speaks some incredible truths to the crowds, truths that we love to dig in and explore. But when we want to see the life transformation, the real, where the rubber meets the road, transformation, we see it happening one at a time whether it's through the life-giving words that created a new world for a prostitute, or whether it's through one conversation at a time with a Samaritan woman. And there are over 40 other instances in which Jesus connected with a person one at a time. And a lot of that time, it was in a person's home, around the table, one meal at a time. And so I want to look at a few of these instances. And the first one happens in Luke 5. And starting in verse 27, we read, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? So Jesus is walking along and he sees Levi. And Levi is also known as Matthew in other instances. And this is the same Matthew who wrote one of the biographies of Jesus we find in the Bible. And we're told that Matthew is a Jewish tax collector. And and this is important because these specific men were, were despised, hated, looked down upon by their fellow Jews. They were seen as traitors, sleazy men who had cozied up with Rome to make themselves rich. And yet when Jesus sees Matthew, he calls this quote unquote sleazy man to follow him. And Matthew responds to the call and in quick succession, Jesus finds himself in this sleazy man's home around a table, sharing a meal together. And it's not only with Matthew, but Matthew invites his closest friends. These people don't show up by accident. Fellow tax collectors and quote-unquote others. 
And I'm safe, I think it's safe to assume that by others, Luke's not referring to the religious or the clean or the, the people who have it all together, rather more sinners, more sleazy characters like Matthew. And what happens? The religious leaders are incensed at this behavior. This story happens fairly early in Jesus' ministry, but by this point, we've already seen Jesus cast out demons and heal many people. And so the Pharisees and other religious leaders have begun to take notice of this Jesus character, and they're asking questions, trying to discover who is this Jesus guy? Is this guy somebody we should follow? But this episode, this eating with a bunch of sleazeballs, like that, that goes too far. Being in the home of a person like Matthew, eating and sharing his food just is one step too far because a holy man, a man sent from God for the religious leaders, that kind of person wouldn't eat with a character like Matthew or his friends. Because you have to understand for the Pharisees and other religious leaders and even the Jewish people as a whole, who you ate with said a lot about your relationship with God and, and whether you were holy enough, clean enough, worthy enough to participate in all the other Jewish practices. The Pharisees believe that being in someone's home around their table, especially in someone's home like Matthew, that would disqualify you from being allowed to participate in other practices. It would be like for you today being not welcomed into church because you ate with Matthew. Because you see whatever culture you're a part of, whether it's here or abroad, whether it's today or thousands of years ago, who you share food with one meal at a time has always had a way of determining group dynamics. Who is in and who is out? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, Andrew, maybe back then, but, but we're better, right? I want you to remember high school lunch. You remember, right? Because you can probably picture the different groups and you can spe remember specifically whether it was a quad outside or whether it was an indoor cafeteria. You knew where each group sits. If we went back to your high school, you could show me because you knew those specific places and you didn't transgress those boundaries. You had to be invited to participate with some of those groups. And that's what's going on here with Jesus and the Pharisees. But unlike many high schoolers, Jesus doesn't care about those artificial boundaries. Why? Because he knows that being at a table, sharing one meal at a time, Matthew and his sleazy character friends could find hope, could find healing, forgiveness, acceptance. And time and time again, we see Jesus engaging in this behavior and one of his last one-on-one -on -one interactions, again, centers around the table with another tax collector, another sleazy character, this time named Zacchaeus. And so, in Luke 19, we read, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus is entering Jericho, and this is his final stop before he heads to Jerusalem, before he enters Jerusalem on a donkey on that day we now call Palm Sunday. And Jesus knows he's headed to Jerusalem to be killed, to be crucified by the same religious leaders who were incensed at his behavior back in Luke 5. And so what does Jesus do in this instance? He sees another tax collector, Zacchaeus, and immediately invites himself over for dinner. And now I'm, I'm no PR expert, 
But if I was to give Jesus advice, not that he was asking and not that he needs my advice, I don't think my advice would center around going to another sleazy character's house and make the religious leaders want to kill you even more. But that's what Jesus does. Why? Because he doesn't care about those artificial boundaries. He's not thumbing his nose at the leaders. He's not even trying to stick it to the institution. He's simply breaking down barriers. He's inviting people, people whom others had said were not worthy to be in the presence of God to find love, meaning, acceptance, and a new way of life at the table, one meal at a time. And once again, people get upset at this behavior. But there's a difference. In Luke 5, we're told that it was the Pharisees who were upset and grumbled. But in Luke 19, it says, all the people who saw this began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Through one meal at a time with people who needed hope, Jesus had made not only the Pharisees upset, but all of the Jewish people. Why? He is breaking down the boundaries that they thought were necessary to maintain their identity as God's chosen people. Jesus shows us that eating with people, we have an incredible opportunity to build relationships with people from all walks of life. When you and I sit down at a table and share a meal, whether that's pizza or steak, whether that's home cooked or takeout, whatever it may be, we begin to see that person as more than just an idea, more than just clean or unclean, believer or unbeliever, safe or unsafe, but rather we see them as Jesus sees them, a person in need of love, of grace, of acceptance. And what happens? Deep bonds are formed one meal at a time, which lead to one conversation at a time, to one word at a time. Would it be possible for you to share a meal with your one? I mentioned earlier that my journey with food and the table led to a renewed relationship with my grandpa in which I was able to develop a friendship and discover his stories with him. And in fact, here's a picture of me, my dad, and my grandpa. We're having dinner at the restaurant I worked at in LA. And 25 years ago or more, this picture wouldn't have been possible. Because you see, growing up, my grandpa was not the sort of grandpa who liked kids, and he wasn't the sort of grandpa kids liked. He was of the opinion that kids should neither be seen nor heard. And I remember uh, he and my dad had started a business back in 1984, and as I grew older, I would do odd jobs around there to earn some money on weekends. And usually it was my grandpa telling me what to do, and it had to be done, that jobs had to be done to his exact standards even how you wrapped cords behind the computer that no one ever saw. And if you didn't do it his way, you got an earful. Again, growing up, it's not the picture I'd hoped for in, in what I wanted from a grandpa. But when I moved back from China, I lived in an apartment that was within walking distance to his condo. And by this time, my grandma had passed away, so he was living alone. And as I began to cook more, I knew from stories from my dad that my grandpa loved, loved good food and good wine. And, and so I took a chance and I asked him, hey, could I cook, cook you dinner? And it was a calculated risk on my part because a few weeks before I'd asked my grandpa, my sister had done this and had had a great time. So I thought maybe, just maybe it's worth a shot. And so it, at least once a month for a year, I would cook him dinner. And we had this deal that I could try out whatever recipe I wanted to buy any ingredient I needed to within reason, and he would reimburse me for the cost because I was a poor grad student at this time. And then he would also provide the wine for the, for the dinner. And it used usually two or more bottles. <laughs> Different story. <laughs> but at first I, I cooked for him because I wanted to try new recipes. I wanted to try a new technique. It was with my grandpa that I tried my first Beurre Blanc recipe, which is a very finicky French sauce. But over time, 
these meals evolved into more than just techniques. One meal at a time led to friendship and stories. Because often at these meals, we would linger at the table for three to four hours. And it was at, this, at his table that I heard stories about my grandpa and his upbringing. How much he loved his mom who passed away before he was 20, but whom he had promised he would not marry till he was 21. So what do you think he did on his 21st birthday? He and my grandma got married. I also heard stories about his dad, how he, how he adored him growing up, but then began to discover the type of man he was and used words I, I cannot repeat here. But it was through that that I began to realize that my grandpa was working to rid our family of generational sins, that he was doing a little better, that allowed my dad to do a little better which is hopefully helping me do a little better. But most importantly, I saw a man who deeply loved his wife, Anita, my grandma. Like I mentioned, my grandma had already passed away. She passed away in December of 2004 after a debilitating stroke in 1993. And it was at these meals I, I heard about his regret for not loving her more. His regret for buying into the lie that his father had told him that you were not to sp supposed to display your affection for your wife in public. But I also heard about the best years of his marriage, which took place when they were living in Connecticut for a few years. And during this time, my grandpa worked in New York, and so he would take the train to and fro from work each and every day. And on his way home, every day he would stop by a florist, probably in the train station, and pick up a singular rose to give to my grandma each and every night. because it was around the table where I began to see just how much my grandpa adored my grandma. My grandma made grandpa a better man. But I also began to sense how difficult it, it must have been for him to watch grandma's strength, vitality, and love slowly be taken from her, from my grandpa, and from so many others. Because here was the woman he cherished, whom he adored more than any other woman who is responsible for his salvation, literally and figuratively wasting away. And I'm so glad that in the summer of 2012, uh, right before Claire and I moved to Utah, we shared one last meal. It was the last time I saw him. Maybe my grandpa knew that, but he just spoke truth to Claire and I that night. He challenged us to love each other deeply. He challenged me to love Claire like he had hoped he could love my grandma with. Like it, was, it was beautiful. It's a night I cherish. Because you see, one meal at a time, one conversation at a time, led me to love and cherish my grandpa in ways I never thought possible because I heard stories. And don't get me wrong, my grandpa still had his faults and we disagreed on a lot. But when we were at the table, when we were sharing these stories, those disagreements seemed far more inconsequential than anything else in the world. And so, as you and I think about this and, and consider sharing a meal with our ones, where do we start? And for me, I always come back to the Lord's table, to communion, because time and time again, we need to come back to celebrate communion at the Lord's table knowing that it is only through his love, his acceptance of us, that we are able and empowered to share that same love with our ones. So before we even begin to thinking about doing this with others, we need to root ourselves at this table. We need to pull our chair up and sit at this table. Because when Jesus wanted to explain what his death would mean for us, he didn't give us a lecture, he didn't give us a sermon, but he gave us a meal. He asked us to remember his love, 
his breaking down of social and religious barriers with a meal, a meal that informs how we share with others one meal at a time. If you're new with us, communion is something we do each and every week because we need the constant reminder of what Jesus did for us, both individually and communally. I need the reminder that through his death and resurrection, Jesus broke down and threw all the barriers that kept me far from him, while I was, that kept me far from him. Just like he ate with Matthew and Zacchaeus when others said they were still sinners, Christ came and dined with me, with you, while you and I were still sinners. And so we remember Christ at his table first. And so if you have the bread, take the bread together. Let's remember his body given for us. Let us take the cup together, remembering his blood shed for us. So Lord, thank you that you invite us to your table. While we were still sinners, you invited us. And so Lord, may that truth sink deep and inform what we do with others. Amen. So now that we have sat at the most important table, rooting ourselves in the love of Jesus, I think there are some practical steps you and I can take this week to connect. I think this idea resonates for a lot of us because if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, Chris asked us to take a poll in our app about which party we wanted to be invited to. And out of 172 responses, 44% of you, an overwhelming percentage of you said you wanted a dinner party. Maybe you just wanted the invite to the dinner party and not actually throw a dinner party, but it resonates and someone's got to start. So why can't it be you? Why can't it be me? So where do we start? We simply consider who can I invite over for a meal? And maybe it's not a meal. Maybe it's just cookies and drinks. Because you see, after Christmas, our neighbors wanted to see um, and experience sort of the joy of the girls in their Christmas presents. And, and so we invited them over one afternoon just for Christmas cookies and eggnog. It was simple, but effective, right? It doesn't need to be complex. And that brings me to this point. If you do invite people over, make it simple. If your family has a Friday night ritual of a pizza night, invite others to participate with you. If it's going to be more stressful for you to prepare a meal, order takeout. Or if you love to cook and want to cook, don't try a new recipe. Make something you're familiar with. It's more for your sake, right? Do what it, whatever is necessary. The point is to do whatever is necessary for you so you can experience people at your table and be present to them. I heard somebody once say that it is better to eat McDonald's with another person than to eat your organic salad by yourself. So if it's going to be McDonald's because your kids love McDonald's, do it. Because again, the point's not the food. You can prepare the best meal, but if you're not present, if you're not welcoming, if your heart isn't open to what God wants to do through then, that meal could mean possibly nothing. So who can you share with? Secondly, don't just invite, but accept an invitation to someone's home. This is a little more risky, right? It's a lot easier to invite people into our space. It's our house, our rules. But Jesus entered into the homes of others. And so who can, if you get an invitation, go Accept that invitation. Walk into somebody else's home knowing that around the table they may find acceptance and healing because you decided to show up like Jesus showed up. 
and extend that same love to others. As a church, we spent the last two out of the th three weeks talking about food, we talked about parties, and you might be thinking to yourself, like, aren't there more important issues to grapple with as a body? And when I think about that question, which is a fair question, I'm reminded of a quote from one of my favorite food authors, M.F.K. Fisher. M.F.K. Fisher was a food writer during World War II, and yet she chose to write about food during this time and was asked the question a lot about why does she write about food? And here's her answer, and it's an answer I want to leave us with today. She writes, the easiest answer is to say that like most other humans, I am hungry. But there is more than that. It seems to me that our three basic needs for food and security and love are so mixed and mingled and entwined that we cannot straightly think of one without the others. So it happens that when I write of hunger, I am really writing about love and the hunger for it and warmth and the love of it and the hunger for it and then the warmth and richness and reality of hunger satisfied and it is all one. And this is my favorite part. There is communion of more than our bodies when bread is broken and wine drunk. And that is my answer when people ask me, why do you write about hunger and not wars or love? So Lord, may we recognize the communion of more than bodies when bread is broken and wine is drunk. Amen.